So that if the millennial knows that you care more about them, you have the betterment for them, you have, you have the better plans for them, and you have a true heart for them, then they'll want to stay around a little bit longer. Because if I know that you care about me, Dean Lindsay, if I know Jeremy Jones cares about me, then of course I'm going to come to the business at sunrise. Welcome to Beyond the Ball Podcast. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I want everybody just to take a second. Let's just, let's just do a temperature check. And I want you just by a show of hands, just raise your hand if you've ever had a terrible day. Okay, I'm glad we can be honest. I feel comfortable now. I'm glad we can be honest. Because for me, one day, I just came into work. And I don't know, this wasn't a regular day. Had a long weekend because I chose to have one, of course. <laughs> Came into work and I had this manager. She wasn't, she wasn't a regular manager by any stretch. She was that manager that was always on, on 10. She was like, Jonathan. I said, hi, Marlene. She said, how are you doing? How was your weekend? What did you do? I said, it was okay. I didn't, I didn't do anything special. I just hung out with a few friends. We went out, did a few things. She said, well, Jonathan, well, how about this? She said, I'm going to go in the back and I'm going to do a few different tasks I have to just complete. And then when I come out in about five minutes, I want your attitude to change. Can we do that? I said, sure, Marlene. Because during this time, I had a really tough job. I had a really, really tough job. Because I worked high-end retail. So I had just a few tasks that I was in charge of doing. One was folding jeans, putting them on a shelf. Folding jeans, Will, and then putting them on a shelf. It was stressful. Okay. It was really, it was stressful. And I don't know why, but I was fed up. It got to the point where it wasn't fun anymore. And about a year and a half before this, I really desired to have this job. This is the job that I wanted more than anything. But then that day, something shifted. And then when Marlene came back out the back room, she said, Jonathan, I, I just don't get it. She said, you always find something to complain about. She said, if it's not you coming in to work extra hours that you asked for, or if it's just me asking you to do a specific task, like going to greet customers, then you always have an attitude. Can you help me understand? Because right now, I'm just really not, not getting it. And as Dean said, I typically speak and work with millennials going to colleges, universities. And one thing that's often said about millennials, I'm sure you all know, that millennials are ungrateful. Millennials are entitled. And there's, a li there's a laundry list of other things that they say about quote unquote millennials. However, as I began to look over my own story, then I began to realize that I'm that guy, or I was that guy. But getting this place, Marlene, who was my manager at the time, she provided one of the best gifts that I didn't even know I necessarily needed at the time because I thought my attitude was fine. I thought it was okay. But she really challenged me to take a moment and to be thankful. That's why it's the first chapter in my book. I start off with being thankful. Because understanding that when we allow ourselves to be in a position and a posture, to be thankful for everything that we have. When we wake up in the morning and we reflect, we write down maybe one, maybe two, maybe three items that we can focus in on and really just gear our energy towards, then that sets the climate for the rest of our day. That allows us ultimately to begin to be able to share that light with other people. Then I vowed from that day, after I came back, Marlene came back from vacation. She was on 12 now, fresh off vacation. She had all this energy. I said, God, please sit in the corner somewhere. Please, just stay over there away from me, just please. But during this time, I understood why she was able to be so joyful and so happy, because she had the ability to be thankful. And from then, I vowed to now live a life to pursue positivity, to help people see what it looks like to be optimistic. Because when we do these things, this is when we now 
allow ourselves to encourage other people in our daily actions. I'm not saying life doesn't get hard because life, life hits us all. Sometimes, I'm sure many of us did not want to wake up this morning. I'm sure you didn't. But on those days, that's when we have to find that little, that little sliver of light, that little thing to be grateful for. And then that gives us encouragement to just push throughout our day. We, we're happy to have the job that we have as opposed to complaining about it. We're happy to have the family or the spouses that we have instead of saying, she always nags me. I don't know why I married this woman. She always nags me. She's always on my case. Instead of, being, instead of saying, Thank you for always checking up on me, making sure I have the keys. Thank you, honey, for making sure that I have my phone. Thank you for just double checking, making sure that I ate, because you know sometimes I might not eat. Because we get busy as entrepreneurs, business owners. I know you know, Dr. Darren. And that was one of the things I'm, I'm eternally grateful and indebted to her for. But even on top of that, do you all have, a, have like one of those core beliefs that you have in your mind that a parent left with you? Like even, even over time, what, what would be one that you have that a parent left with you? You're not allowed to make money. You're not allowed to make money? Yeah, making money is a bad thing. Making money is a bad thing, okay. I broke, I broke through that one, by the way. That's good. I, I know you have. I know you have. With those books, I know you have. Because there, there, was, there was a few core beliefs my parents taught me, and just as you all know, some stick, some, they kind of roll off your back like water, just like ducks, just, just rolls off your back. But my parents would teach me, wash the dishes when you come home, because this way, when you get off work, you don't have to worry about cleaning the kitchen. Many of us, I'm sure, went to college, and we've seen a sink full of dishes with our roommates, and we're like, why can't you just clean the dishes? Another one my parents told me, son, just take time and straighten your bed. Now, I don't know about you, but this morning I was... It was, it was a real battle for me to straighten my bed all the way. I pulled the, I pulled the main cover over, but the, the undersheets, I, really, I don't really worry about those. I said, you know what? That's 50-50. But there was one thing that my, my mom and my dad always made sure that I understood, made sure that my brother understood, was cultivating a heart of service. Giving more than you take. Always making sure those around you are good and making sure that they're accounted for, making sure that they have everything that they need. And when I say a heart of service, you might first think that, well, what specifically is he talking about? I'll make it a little more plain. Being a giver. And I specifically say being a giver, and I'm not even talking about money, because I know that's the first thing somebody might say, wait, nope. You're not getting in my pocket. Not today. Not next week. But when I say being a giver, I'm talking about giving what you can afford to give. For some of you in the room, you might have a little bit more time than you have money. So it might look like taking a day out of your week to go volunteer downtown at the stew pot. Getting to know the people who are in your community in Dallas who you might not interact with anywhere else. It might be taking a moment giving a friend a listening ear because you know that, that they've been facing some challenges in their life. You've seen that they've been affected maybe by getting laid off from work. Somebody who maybe still hasn't found a way to get back on their feet based on what happened in Houston or many other areas because tragedy is all around us. But taking the time just to give somebody what you can afford to give, a compliment, doesn't cost anything. A hug. You might not want to touch somebody, but hey, you can give somebody a hug. Or maybe even just taking somebody, to, taking a moment and giving somebody an encouraging word. Because you know, just as a lot of individuals are in here, CEOs, business owners, entrepreneurs, life gets tough when you start looking at that bottom line some days and you say, you know what? If somebody could just just give me a little encouragement, because a lot of you all here are at the top of the food chain. And then you're almost at a place where people just assume that you have it all together. They assume that you don't need an encouraging word. They assume that you don't need to be uplifted. Because they say, you know what? I see Dee Lindsay every time I look on the computer screen. He's always on the stage. He doesn't need my encouragement. He's fine. Thanks, Dave. He doesn't need my encouragement. <laughs> 
<laughs> so being a giver is, is the second thing I want to just challenge us to take time and see, because I didn't want to wake up when I was younger. My mom would say, son, you want to wake up and want to go volunteer at the, no, mom. Son, do you want to take a moment and just give fruit baskets to the nursing home? No, mom. But still, my mother and my father religiously went out, constantly giving back, constantly giving back. And now that bug has finally bit me. So now I'm more conscious everywhere I go, I always like to give more value than I try to take in any situation. And that's even why every time I sell a book now, every time I sell a book, I donate one. Because I do some work with the young man in the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. So every time I sell a book, I donate one to a young man that I mentor just so that they can have books. But we already talked about taking a moment and being thankful because we all have something to be thankful for. Would you all agree we all have something to be thankful for? Something. Just make sure we can be real. Just make sure we can be honest. And in addition to that, would you say we all have something to give? Somebody has, we all have something to give. You might want to give me your watch. You might not. No, that's fine. Please. Later. Later. Not in front of everybody. Later. We'll talk about that later. And then the last thing I just want to just charge us to do Understand that we're here in this, in this beautiful venue with the mood lighting. It's, it's, it's very romantic, Jeremy. Y'all did a great job. It's very romantic. And looking at each and every one of you influential individuals in here in your own respect, as everybody went around and introduced themselves and shared specifically what it is that they do, what they're probably at a, a master at. Because I know Simone, she's a master when it comes to social media, her graphics unbelievable, the quality of the product that she puts out, phenomenal. But I want to charge us today to take a moment and make sure we connect with somebody in this room. Because if, Will, you work for college football playoff, but you see somebody that you know you can add value to, and you vow just to not say anything, then what value are you adding at all? None. And the reason I want to charge it so strongly is because I was, I was guilty. Social media, millennials, we love social media. It's easy to get behind a computer screen. I see you, Dean Lindsay, but I'm not going to say anything. I'll just connect with you on LinkedIn. I see you, Mr. Butts, but I'm not going to say anything. I'll just follow you on Instagram. I'll send you a tweet. You'll, you'll get back to me fast if I tweet you. And being that person, having a Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Snapchat, all of them. I'd love to connect with each of you on all of them. I have no problem doing that. We definitely can do that. But outside of that, I was in a cocoon. Nothing came in, nothing went out. Until I realized that I had to be a social butterfly. Had to diversify my relationships. I realized the more people I meet, the more people I add to my network, I can add more value to other people around me. For instance, Reginald Titus here before us, videographer extraordinaire. Every time I go anywhere, I always make sure I introduce Reginald because I know he can add value to somebody's product. I know he can add value to whatever somebody's doing. Executive producer of a film. Amazing. So I want you to not let today pass by without getting the opportunity to connect with somebody else in this room, adding value to somebody else. Because it's not always about what's in it for me. It should be focusing on the we over the me, because ultimately, that's how we all win. That's how we all win. Allowing ourselves to be a social butterfly. Dean, as, as you always have a heart for service, you've shown me also really what that looks like. Darren, you as well. Just seeing how you all love to celebrate people, and Jeremy, how you create an environment for all of us to come together and to allow this to be conceived. So I just want to challenge us today to be thankful, to be a giver, and most importantly, be a social butterfly. Diversify your relationships. Dean? All right. You hang up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it.
Well done, good sir. Thank well you. done. All right, I would like to ask some questions. I'm going to assume these questions are kind of coming from the audience because I know we have some leaders who are not millennials. That's right. And everything you just set up there is a choice that a, 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 an individual has to make. How do we help millennials that maybe we are leading mm -hmm. uh, develop gratitude, develop uh, a service heart to be more giving? Uh, I'm assuming that that would be traits that you uh, that you are ho hoping that millennials will choose to have. How do we as leaders encourage that? Definitely. Um, one, one area I know that's, that's really pivotal is getting to know that individual, getting to know that millennial, getting to know whoever it is might work for you. And then when you get to know them on a deeper level, then you can see where their heart lies. And so does that also reconnect that it's more challenging to get to know millennials because there is this level of social media that people are hiding behind? Is that, is that a new something that we need to be more conscious of? Because the concept of getting to know somebody in a general sense, is it just that we're so busy that we're not really tapping into how millennials, mm -hmm. what, their, their, what their process is for um, choosing behavior? Well I, well, I would take a step back first and say that we have to understand that we're different. You know, Gen X, millennials, baby boomers, we're, there are differences. But through those differences, I think that each one of us kind of have holes. And I think the other generations are ultimately like the ooze that can help connect us throughout those holes. So understanding that first, like I said, identifying where the individual's heart lies, where their passion is. And if I find out what you're passionate about, where you want to give back, then I can create an opportunity for you to give back there. If I find out that you want to be a leader, you want, some, you want the opportunity for expansion within the company, then create little opportunities for you to take lead, but still allow me to have you on, on a leash, but still give you some ownership within that. I like that. Okay, so, you're, so, so don't make, here's what we're doing as a company. We're giving to this organization, but rather finding out what, it's, what the individuals, what they're passionate about, and then helping them um, give in that arena, which then they can feel the benefits of and then want to do it more, and which also gains them more commitment to the organization. More commitment to the organization, and also surveys actually show that if the millennial knows that you care more about them, you have the betterment for them, you have, you have the better plans for them, and you have a true heart for them, then they'll want to stay around a little bit longer. Because if I know that you care about me, Dean Lindsay, if I know Jeremy Jones cares about me, then of course I'm going to come to business at sunrise. I do care. Of I course. Care about you. I don't care of about course. John so that, so I mean, that, that's, so I, I mean, I think that's really a big piece, getting to know the individual, letting them know that you genuinely care about them, and then that, that allows us to ultimately so open that door. So it's, so it's empathy, it's mm -hmm. patience, it's persistence, it's light guidance. It's helping them see that we really are on their side. Yes, I would say that. And just because let's call let's call millennials a plant, right? Let's do. Let's call millennials a plant. And what what's one thing we know plants need? They need they need soil, they need water, and they need sun. And these are essential for them to grow. But if we invest those things into this plant, we know it'll bloom to its fullest potential. And if you if you're a CEO, if you're you know, the owner of your company, et cetera, and you want the company to grow to its fullest potential, you want to maximize everybody within our organization. So therefore, you want to What should to do I that. not do as a leader guiding millennials? What's a no-no? Micromanaging. I don't know. Some people might like to hear things multiple times, but I'm, like, I'm a millennial, clearly, and I work, with my, I work with my dad. Me and him work together, and I've had to let him know, Dad, I know you like to hear things multiple times. I don't. I know. Yeah, just so I, no I, micromanage. As a leader, mm -hmm. I don't want to micromanage. Okay. But I also don't feel like they got it all straight. I don't feel like they got it. I don't know what. So what do I need to do to not micromanage, but at mm -hmm. the same time, me feel as a leader that they got it, that they're going to be able to handle what I need them to do. Once again, going back first, making sure that you understand and you know, like you know how this individual operates and how they work. Because mm -hmm. some people might need to be micromanaged. Some people might need that. Or educated. Fully and then and then and then make sure that they're educated fully and fully equipped with everything they need, and then maybe check in, or hey, here's this checkpoint. Let's let's touch base here. I know there's this big project, but let's check base. Let, let's check back right here in a couple of weeks. Couple see weeks. where you so are. So give them a guideline. And then here you let are. Them know when mm -hmm. that there are going to be some times. So it's not just here. I'm going to come check on you, but actually giving them some type of a, of a timing every every Saturday or every Friday or every whatever the timeline is. When you reach this plateau, let me know, that type of thing. Definitely, right. definitely, because that, way, because that way you further create the relationship because there's more visibility, more face time. You get to talk with one another, sit down with one another. The relationship's built. Then you can tell that, oh, they really do care about me. And then also, as you're checking up progress, nobody likes to be the one sitting in the meeting like, okay, well, 
Dean, where are the reports? And you're like, oh, I don't, I don't have the reports. And if, if they know that there's that level of ownership, right. then ultimately they'll, they'll step up to the challenge. They'll step up to the challenge. Yes. Of course, I can't speak for, that's a phenomenal question. Of course, I can't speak for on behalf of all millennials, but I can say I feel that the reward system is a little bit different because I've often heard this generation labeled as the generation of the participation trophy because just for showing up, people often say that, oh, millennials expect this and expect that, and we give them a paycheck, so why aren't they happy with that? I would say find a, developing a system that's incentivized based on, once again, what that individual likes. If you know that this individual has aspirations to be a CEO, then allow them areas of opportunity to show uh, ownership over projects, over tasks, and then potentially they can be elevated through, through that manner. Or, I mean, if, if they enjoy being paid a little extra, I mean, or maybe, maybe buying, partnering with the House of Blues and purchasing a couple memberships and saying, you know what? Good job, I, I, I know you. I know Good you enjoy. Job. I know you enjoy going out, hanging out. I saw your eyes kind of twitching. Why would hey, you not? Is a good idea. I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna tie this in. <laughs> Why would you not purchase some memberships? You know, with, with the foundation room, come to the House of Blues. That's the smartest thing you've said all morning. <laughs> so, so, so first, I would say getting to know the individual, seeing you know, seeing where that passion lies, and then as you get to know them, then you'll be able to see what they like, what they don't like. Maybe treating them to a dinner, treating them to a lunch or even maybe providing mentorship because that's something that we can't that's something that we can't we can't mentor ourselves. We can but then we might go in the same circle. If I if I get with a friend who's the same age as me, we're going to go around the same circle. But if there's somebody who's older than me and I know they have wisdom, I know they have insight, then providing some of your time and getting to know what they want, what they desire and then creating incentivized systems I think would be beneficial. We got to wrap it up ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Jones. Thank you, Thank you. Thank good you. sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.